Hello, BookTube. Well, it's that melancholy moment. We face it every week. We are now at the last mail hall of the week. Uh, it's not that bad in size. Of course, there's nothing in size compared to yesterday. And it does end in a box, but the box is significantly smaller than the wonder boxes, <laughs> the one, two wonder boxes that devastated me this week. Uh, so I've got, I've got the packages here. I've got my shredder on standby. So we'll, let's see what we have. Let's see what, what, uh, what's here that may be of any interest. She's not springing into view. <laughs> I don't know why. She's not tired. There we go. There we go. <laughs> All right. Let's see here. Uh, okay. This is from Harvard University Press. It's a finished copy, so it's probably soon. Yeah, it's October. Uh, it's nothing I requested, but it, it's right along the subject, a subject that has been fascinating me in 2018. This is by Jonathan Lushtas, and it is... Uh, Industry of Anonymity, Inside the Business of Cybercrime. Look at those things. That is just trouble. <laughs> that cover is just trouble. It's fairly well designed, nice and somber. Uh, there can be a temptation to view cybercrime as an almost invisible phenomenon, orchestrated by unseen and unknown actors. And yet somewhere in the world there is always a person sitting at a keyboard. <laughs> That's putting it mildly, yes. Somewhere in the world, probably... There is always at least one million people sitting at keyboards at any minute now. Uh, that person has a life and exists in a specific social setting, and these days is also usually embedded within a professional network of criminal colleagues. Hobby hackers still exist, and politically driven hacktivists attract our attention, but as sociologist Jonathan Lushthaus uh, shows, cybercrime has by now matured into a large and highly organized profit-driven industry. Okay, I've never read, I, I'm very interested in the subject of the, of the cyber world and cyber hacking and cyber warfare and whatnot, but cyber crime, especially viewed in such a, you know, a comprehensive academic lens, that I haven't read yet, so wonderful, fantastic. All right, uh, good, we're off to a good non-fiction-y start, that's what I like, let's see what this next one is. Are you more active? You ready for another one? Yes, here we go. <laughs> All right, what have we got here? Oh, goodness gracious. Okay, is this Harvard as well? Yes, it is. Okay, this comes out in early November. Uh, it's Republicanism in Russia. The subtitle is Community Before and After Communism. It's by Oleg Karkodin. If Marxism <laughs> was the apparent loser in the Cold War, it cannot be said that liberalism was the winner. At least not if in Russia. The author is not surprised that institutions of liberal democracy failed to take root following the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Uh, neither was I. I don't think a lot of people were, but we hoped. We hoped. Uh, in this book, uh, he suggests that Russians can find a path to freedom by looking instead to the classical tradition of Republican self-government and civic engagement already familiar from their history. Hmm, okay, it doesn't matter what they look for. If the state has guns, then it doesn't matter what the public looks for. Uh, I guess they could look for it in classical republicanism, but what, what difference does it make if they'll be shot if they show up in numbers greater than 100? Uh, by embracing the indigenous Russian reception of the classical republican tradition, the author argues today's Russians can sever their country's dependence on the residual mechanisms of the communist past. Okay, so I don't know about... Uh, the indigenous Russian reception of the classical Republican tradition. I don't know about that. I don't. I don't even know that that that, that is an actual phenomenon. So this is going to teach me a lot. Who, who is the author? Sorry for the noise. Uh, he's a professor of political science and sociology at European University in Saint Petersburg. Lovely Saint Petersburg. Oh. A lovely city, uh, in the bowels of which lurked the part of the cyber destruction of the 2016 U.S. presidential election. It happened in, from many places, but mostly from St. Petersburg. Uh, I won't be visiting St. Petersburg again. It's amazing to think that my travel days are over and that I've seen St. Petersburg for the last time. I, uh, I've been there a few times and I've loved it. It's, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, back to this guy. 
Uh, he has been a visiting professor at Harvard, Yale, and the Sciences Po, and is the author of uh, The Collective and the Individual in Russia and Main Concepts of Russian Politics. Okay, so he's, he's written other books on not only Russian politics, but the Republican strain in Russian politics. That's, that's a new wrinkle for me. So that's, that's, once again, you know, thank God for Harvard University Press. Thank God for the well-endowed university presses that get to come out with books like these that are utterly fascinating. I, I mean, they're probably expensive. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure how much the general reader would go for one of these things. I'm also not sure uh, where the general reader would find these things. I mean, I, I, here in, in the greater Boston area, I, I know for sure that something like this or this will probably not be at the one remaining large chain bookstore, Barnes & Noble, probably you would have to go, if you're in Boston, you would have to go across the river into Cambridge and go to the Harvard Bookstore, which may have these things. But And libraries, of course, will have them. I have to think that libraries are the business they're going for. And they don't seem to have much of a commercial appeal. But one way or another, I'm so glad these books exist. I'm, my reading life has been so incredibly broadened by them. And if we didn't have university presses, I don't think they would exist. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> anyway, let's, let's move on here. We still have packages to do, and the bean is still hungry. <laughs> huh, okay. All right, we move from uh, from egghead history to uh, a thriller. Uh, by, an author, by an author that I did not request this, and it's an author I admit has never really done anything for me. Uh, this comes out at the end of October, and this is Michael Connolly. This is the new Michael Connolly, Dark Sacred Night. Um, <laughs> uh, this is a is a Harry Bosch novel, uh, and it, it it also stars uh, Detective Rene Ballard. It teams them up, Ballard and Bosch. I don't know if that's the first time that's happened. No, it is. This is the very first time that it's happened where they it's to solve the murder of a, of a young girl. Um, okay, so. This is his 32nd novel and combines the world of Bosch and Ballard, an iconic pairing. A great deal of René Ballard was inspired by an L.A. police, an LA detective whom Michael works closely with on Bosch, his original drama series. As critics have mentioned time and again over the past two decades, Michael Connolly's attention to detail and the authenticity of his characters and locations are what truly set him apart from other crime writers. Okay... All right, well, maybe I should try it again. I, I confess that it's, a, it's on exactly that grounds that these books have tended to disappoint me, uh, because they, they, do sort of, they do sort of hold themselves as police procedurals, and they seem weak to me as police procedurals, on that ground specifically. I, I can sometimes like his dialogue and sometimes his characters, but the, the, it, 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 it's it, previous books of his that I, I've only read the Harry Bosch. I don't think I've ever read any Ballard novels, but I, the Harry Bosch novels... It seems to me that they fail uh, most consistently on the very grounds of police procedural. So, uh, you know, I just recently read a <coughs> uh, Lee Child novel uh, for the first time in ages. Maybe it's time I go back to this author. Maybe I, the timing is, is the key. Maybe I'll just do that. I'll just read this thing and see what I can see. I, I read uh, the new Jack Reacher novel and really liked it. So maybe. We'll, we'll see. I'll, I'll give it a try. Uh, let's see here. We'll move on to some some cardboard. Are you up for some cardboard? Hmm? <laughs> yeah. Alright, so what have we got here? Okay, this is from Minotaur Books. This comes out uh, in a week, and this is a murder mystery. Uh, this is by Catrion of McPherson, and it is Go to My Grave. Uh, prolific Agatha-winning author Catriona McPherson returns to the world of standalone psychological suspense novels with the intensely spooky Go to My Grave. McPherson's latest is a spine-tingling and reads like Agatha Christie's take on a gothic thriller. Okay. <laughs> Donna Weaver has put everything she has into restoring The Breakers, an old bed and breakfast on a remote stretch of beach in Galloway. Now it sits waiting... Freshly painted, richly furnished, filled with flowers for the first guest to arrive. I think we saw this. Did we see an advanced copy of this? This is sounding familiar to me. Problem is, I don't know. 
because I read catalogs all the time. I'm constantly prowling through uh, the bookstores. So I, I don't know whether or not I've read this description to you or whether I've read it to myself. Uh, but Donna's guests are a contentious group of estranged cousins soon realize that they, are, that they have been here before, years ago. I do think we saw this before. Decades have passed, but that night still haunts them. A 16th birthday party that started with pea schnapps and ended with a girl walking into the sea. Okay, well, yeah, I think we did. I think we did see this already, but I know that I haven't read it. Uh, so, and it's right around the corner. So, this and the Michael Connolly are right on the top of the list now. Uh, let's uh, let's see. Let's move on here as we inch closer and closer to the box. What have we got here for glare? Are we, are we all right for glare? Is that any better for glare? I don't know. It's, we're all low tech here, anyway. So, <laughs> with you. All right, so what's this next one? Also a hardcover. Ooh. Okay. All right, this is by John Kehe. This is the finished copy of Sicilian Splendors. Uh, discovering the secret places that speak to the heart. Look at that. I spent a great deal of time on Sicily. Uh, from Palermo to... Uh, Alimena, Sicily holds great secrets from the past and unspoken promises. Tradition, in the form of festivals, the written word, photographs, and song, reverberates through the village walls. Now, slowly shaking itself free of the mafia, I wish. <laughs> I, it's a, that's a great dream. But uh, anyway, uh, Sicily is opening itself up to visitors in ways that it never has before. I lived in Termina. For, for a long time, for a good stretch of time. I got to know my landlady really well. I got to know her sons really well. Uh, I got to know the food really well. <laughs> and I could not for the life of me. I just, uh, the Sicilians that I knew when I was there, I was right on the coast, and the Sicilians that I knew were fish. They were basically fish. They, I could not understand their willingness to plunge into ocean water. I just could not understand it. They're from Sometimes from high rocks. And... Uh, and to live it, I mean, the, the, I, when I was there, the time that I was there, there was only one severe storm, but uh, these people seem to have this, the, the, the people in the village where I lived, I mean, it was just outside of Tarmina, and the village where I lived, people seemed to have the sea in their blood. It was amazing. Uh, it reminded me of Venice. <laughs> uh, through conversing with natives and immersing himself in culture, the author illustrates a brand new Sicily no one has ever talked about before. Villagers, eager to welcome tourism and impart awareness of their cultural background, greet him for meals and drinks and walk him through their winding streets. Okay, well that sounds familiar. I was I was stuffed like a tick. <laughs> I, was, I was fed enormous amounts of food at every turn. Uh, took a while to get uh, as this book this book somewhat unselfconsciously refers to those people as natives. Uh, it took a while uh, in my village for to to accustom the natives. Uh, to dogs, to the, to the presence of dogs, my dogs and the dogs that I picked up when I got there. Uh, the idea that, that these dogs would roam around my shins and not bother me and not bother anybody else if I told them not to was one thing. But once the people, and especially my landlady, realized that the dogs were going to live inside with me and, and the, the boy who delivered food easily noticed that the dogs not only lived inside my room, but lived on my bed. <laughs> Once that word got out, it was a little harder to deal with. <laughs> uh, but I did. I did. I am. I, I was always not only a friend to dogs wherever I went, but also their foremost ambassador. I made sure people knew that there's, there's nothing wrong with that at all. I, I uh, took a little bit of preliminary work first. My beagles weren't always very friendly. And some of the uh, the village dogs, the, the pie dogs, the pariah dogs that I, I scooped up wherever I went, some of them weren't very friendly either. <laughs> I, so I had to give the dogs a lesson in manners first before I moved on. But still, uh, the place holds wonderful memories for me. So this is going to be amazing. I don't think I ever got an advanced copy of this. Uh, wow, okay. And the author is based in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, he's a retired newspaper and reporter and editor and a self-described writer who travels. Hmm. First visited Sicily in 1986. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and, in, and Enchanted keeps returning in between writing other travel narratives. Uh, the subject of his books range from southern Italy to Venice. What? 
he's written a book about Venice. I wonder if his books are listed here. I wonder if I've read his book. Oh, yes. Okay, he did. He wrote a book on Venice called Venice Against the Sea, A City Besieged, and I did read it, and it was really good. Uh, okay, I didn't know that. I didn't recognize his name. A terrible author's name. So, uh, great. So we have Sicilian Splendor. Wonderful. All right, so uh, now we do the box. Uh, it's a smaller thing. So, uh, oh, and it's, it's, it's taped like it was being sent to Mars instead of Boston, so I don't think it came from a publisher. Uh, let's let's see. Let's cut our way into this thing and see what it is. Nope, even that won't do it. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, as someone who mails packages all day every day, I can tell you this seems natural, but uh, buttressing and rebuttressing and, and triple buttressing a package like this is really not necessary. <laughs> if force enough force is going to be used on your package to make this necessary, then enough force is going to be used on your package to destroy it. Sealing it is good enough, usually. America has a wonderful postal system. <laughs> what a, oh, oh! Oh, wait here. Okay. Uh, this, yes, okay. Oh, I didn't look at the address. I know what this is here, Bean. Oh, yes. These are not from a publisher. These are from a booktuber. These are from Mark at Richardson Reads. I will leave a link to his uh, channel down below. These are Star Trek novels. Oh my, four Star Trek novels. Uh, and there's a reason for it. Uh, because Matt at Paperback Junkie uh, is doing a read-along for November. Another easy read-along. He's doing Boldly go Vember. A celebration of Star Trek where the read-along challenge is that you, in the month of November, read a Star Trek novel. Any Star Trek novel. Read, reread, whatever. And then if you have a booktube channel and you do it, post a video talking about your book. Of course I signed up. <laughs> I would like to help uh, Matt and Mark and anybody else who's interested to create a much bigger Star Trek readathon for 2019. Uh, but I signed up, and to give it a little bit of extra kick, because... I read a lot. <laughs> I'm one, one, reading one Star Trek book in the month of November is so small a challenge that I might forget it. So I, I, qu I quadrupled it. I, I wrote to Mark and suggested, if you pick four Star Trek novels and send them to me, I will do a Star Trek review each week. I'll do a Star Trek video each week in November. And he did. He found four. Let's see what we have here. Uh, okay, so this first one is by L.A. Graff. And it is, uh, it's the original series, and it's something called Past Prologue Janus Gate. In, in mint condition. I don't know where this guy goes to get his books. His mass market paperbacks are always in mint condition. Uh, so what have we got here? Continuing a fresh new approach to Star Trek adventure. Uh, in the powerful conclusion of this flagship trilogy, oh no! <laughs> oh no! Uh, do I have, do I have the other parts? Oh, I do! Okay. All right, so, uh... Janus Gate is a trilogy, and uh, in, in his thorough librarian way, Mark sent me all three books. So let's go to part one. Uh, they, they all have these, uh, these airbrushed photo, these treated photo covers. Uh, let's go to book one of Janus Gate and see what we have here. Beam aboard for a bold new era in Star Trek storytelling. Beginning with this thrilling all-new trilogy, the original five-year mission of the Starship Enterprise is reimagined via the many valiant crew members who served under the legendary command of Captain James T. Kirk. Who are these exceptional men and women, often asked to make the ultimate sacrifice for the sake of interstellar peace and exploration? What are their stories? Their saga begins in the Janus Gate Part 1, present tense. The crew of the USS Enterprise is exploring the seemingly peaceful and uninhabited world of M3107, when a bizarre and inexplicable transporter accident causes both Captain Kirk and Dr. McCoy to vanish completely. Transporter records suggest that the two men were transported somewhere, but their ultimate destination remains a mystery. Now in command of the Enterprise, Spock dispatches a search and rescue team consisting of Security Chief Giotto, Transporter Technician John Kyle, and Chief Helmsman Hikaru Sulu on an urgent mission to recover the missing officers. But then the rescue team disappears as well. Okay, so I, from the description, I get the impression that this is going to center on secondary characters. Giotto, we, we meet once. Kyle, we meet a couple of times, and he also he makes a transition briefly to the movies. And of course, Sulu was not only in the original series, but was uh, in Star Trek Voyager, and all for one wonderful cameo. And uh, 
was the ended up captain of his own vessel and has starred in a number of Star Trek novels. Uh, so is okay. So is the, are these all going to be about the same rescue team? Uh, no, part two. Uh, no, uh, okay. So this, this is book three. Okay, so book two. Uh, on a desperate rescue mission to recover their missing captain, the shuttle Copernicus and its crew have become lost in time and space, transported by a powerful subspace vortex to a hellish future timeline where the brutal Gorn hegemony has all but conquered the United Federation of Planets. Hmm. Stranded on a transformed Federation colony, now a Gorn mining world, worked by oppressed human slaves, Sulu meets an older version of a man he barely knows, Pavel Chekhov. Uh, who now leads a ragtag band of freedom fighters against the Gorn. So it's it's an alternate future that they're transported to in part two. And then in book three, thanks to the accidental triggering of an ancient alien technology, Captain Kirk has been banished to his own past. During the brutal massacre on Tarsus IV, Kodos the Executioner it must, be, it must be coming up. Uh, yes, okay, Kodos the Executioner entered the history books as one of the most genocidal tyrants of the 23rd century. As a boy, Kirk barely survived. Can he stand by now and let it happen again? <laughs> hmm. uh, okay, so Mark sent me a trilogy. That's three of the four. And then the fourth one is Bob Vardaman's The Klingon Gambit, which is familiar to me. <laughs> it, is, it is very familiar to me. Uh, but I can't wait. I will de I will gladly read this again. This is number three when when uh, they started numbering the Star Trek volumes after the success of, after the big screen movie. They started numbering them. Uh, and that's also when uh, Paramount Corporate suits started marginally getting involved. The book started to take on a standard flavor. Not here, but relatively soon after this, they started to take on a standard flavor uh, to the point where uh, one person who was contracted to write a Star Trek novel in the uh, late 1990s, I was actually talking with him, I knew him, and I was actually talking with him, and he said, yeah, I, I sent my manuscript, and they sent it. when they sent it back to me, I didn't recognize the first hundred pages. I had not written the first hundred pages. The first hundred pages were all the stuff necessary to tick boxes and cover bases by, uh, you know, for intellectual property rights and all that. Uh, oh my, I haven't read this. Well, anyway, let me, let me tell you about it. When Captain Kirk and his crew are ordered to Alnath 2 to change, to challenge the deadliest Klingon ship, Terror, they're ready for anything, or so they think. But the defenseless Vulcan crew of a Federation science ship has been wiped out. The remaining members of the Alnath 2 mission have discovered a fabulous ancient city but their report doesn't make sense. The Klingon battlecruiser has the Enterprise in its sights and is ready to destroy it. But Captain Kirk can't seem to make decisions. Spock has started to throw temper tantrums, and Chekhov has disobeyed vital orders. The crew of the Enterprise are losing their minds, one by one, all victims of the Klingon game. <laughs> all right, so this is my Boldly November. These, this is my Star Trek November. I will probably work in a few other Star Trek books as well, but oh my, Mark, excellent job. Uh, I will read, the, I, I told him that I think I'd read every Star Trek novel ever written, but I have not read this trilogy. I don't think I ever saw it in bookstores. When was this from? Uh, the early 2000s. Wow. Okay, and it's by L.A. Graff, who's a veteran of Star Trek fiction, so it, it, it might end up being good. You never know. All right, fantastic. So that is our uh, our last mail haul of the week. We have Sicilian Splendors, nonfiction about Sicily. We have Go to My Grave, uh, a thriller. We have uh, Dark Sacred Night, which is also a thriller. Then we have Industry of Anonymity, about uh, the cybercrime industry. Not individual cybercrimes, not state-sponsored cyber hacking, but the, the industry of cybercrime. Uh, and republicanism in Russia. Uh, uh, it sounds like it's going to be part history and part political prescription. Uh, can't wait to read it. And then four Star Trek novels for Boldly Govember, which I urge you all to take part in. Boldly Govember is a lot of fun. Uh, but anyway, that's well, this is going to be way long enough, so I don't know if you can even hear me over the sounds of destruction in the background. Uh, so I'll wrap this up. Uh, but, oh, wait, you, have, you want to see Frida, don't you? Uh, they want to see you, Bean. They want to see you. You're a star. Oh, there you are. They like seeing you.
I like seeing you too. I do. <laughs> All right, there you go. So I will uh, I will wrap this up for now, but I will be back. Thank you, Book Two.